my name's Marie and my friend Argo and I get into all sorts of adventures on the internet, but sometimes we can run into some dangers, like a virus or the suspicious message saying that I've won a million dollars. I want to find out how it can keep us safe during these adventures, so I called the person who created it all, Mr. Vince Cerf, the founder of the internet. Hello, Mr. Cerf. How can I make sure that we remain safe on the internet? Hi, Marie. I'm Vince, and it's nice to talk to you this way. Well, there are several things you can do to be safe. The most important thing is that you should keep private information private. Remember, if you're using social media, you want to think carefully about what you share, uh, especially if it's going to be shared with the general public. Many of the services that are on the internet require you to log in. So you want to get some help to make sure that you pick passwords that will be hard for anybody else to guess. That's so helpful, Mr. Seraf. But there's so much information online. How do I tell what's true and what's not? If you're not sure uh, about something you see on the net, you might want to see if there are other sources of that same information so you get some confirmation. You can ask yourself questions about what you're seeing on the net. For example, uh, wh where did this information come from? Do I understand the source of the information? Uh, you might ask, is this information trying to get me to do something that might not be in my best interest? Uh, and if you think your way through that, you might actually be able to decide that some information is not, uh, not valid, not for you, and you should ignore it. That's super helpful. I can't wait to go on another cyberspace adventure with Argo. But before I go, may I find out what exciting things we can expect from the future of the internet? For the last 20 years or so, some of us have been working on making the internet work in outer space. So we have a working interplanetary internet that connects the Earth, the International Space Station, uh, rovers on Mars, on the surface of Mars, and orbiters that are orbiting around Mars so that eventually we'll have an interplanetary backbone that can support both robotic and manned exploration of our solar system. Wow, I'm looking forward to all of that. Thank you, Mr. Surf. I hope to see you again soon. Perhaps we'll meet up in one of my cyberspace adventures with Argo. Bye. Bye bye, thanks for joining me. Today I found out about something really interesting. I learned more about myself. Yes, I'm a robot personal assistant. Oops, I mean, I'm a very cute robot personal assistant to Marie. And I have artificial intelligence, which means I'm not only really cute, I'm also really smart. Artificial intelligence, or AI for short, was created to help humans do what they cannot do and do it even better. Research on AI started in the 1950s, but at that time, researchers couldn't solve some of the more difficult problems like giving computers emotions. So, governments lost interest in the projects and stopped giving money to AI research. It wasn't until the 1990s and early 2000s that research on AI really picked up. By this time, computers were much faster and there was more access to data to help with learning. It allowed people to make computers that are very clever, like me. These computers were able to win humans in games like chess. AI is in lots of things humans use every day. For example, when you're typing an email, AI can guess what you're going to type before you do it and help you complete your sentence. Or maybe you're doing some online shopping for books with action and adventure stories. AI can recommend to you similar books that you may not have read before. It's like AI can read your mind. Ooh. And it makes some humans really afraid of AI and me. Sometimes I'm also afraid of me. What if I turn into a mean killing machine like the Terminator? Or maybe I'm just worrying too much. I may be smart, but there are some things I don't know yet. For example, will robots become too smart and hurt humans? I really don't want to hurt people. So, I've asked a very special guest here to tell us more about it. 
He's robotics expert, Dr. BJ Kumar. Hello, Dr. BJ. Hi, Argo. It's great to meet you. I love meeting robots, but I'm especially pleased to meet you. For the Earth. Many movies and TV shows portray robots as killing machines. Um, do you think I'll be a killing machine, Dr. VJ? <laughs> You're too cute to be a killing machine. No, seriously, you should not believe everything you see on TV or read in books. Robots are amazing. They can help people. They can allow society to advance in ways that we cannot yet imagine. So robots are our friends. Ooh, that's good to know. In my lab, we create robots that can collaborate with each other. The key idea in collaboration is that if you find people that you can work with, you can do things that you cannot do by yourself. So we study examples of cooperation in nature, how ants cooperate, how bees cooperate, how birds cooperate. And then we understand the organization of these colonies, of these groups. And then we create robot groups, robot teams, robot swarms that can collaborate and then do fantastic things that they individually cannot do. And in this way, we create robots that also help people by collaborating with people. That's exciting, Dr. VJ. Can you tell us how robotics is our future? Have you ever had to pick up a sofa in your family room and move it? Well, you probably could do it if you had a friend to help you. But what if you didn't have a friend? Well, if you are living with a robot, you could ask the robot to pick up one end and you pick up the other end and you can move the sofa wherever you want. That's a simple example of collaboration. Let's say you're lying down on the couch. You're either too lazy to get up or perhaps you're not feeling well. Somebody's at the door. You can send your robot to answer the door or to see who's outside or to just get you a glass of water. There are so many different ways that you can create robots that can help people and make our lives better. I wish I could help Marie with those things, but I don't think I was built for that. Thank you, Dr. VJ. I'm so excited for the future. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ahem. <clears throat> so let's make a video game using a programming language called Scratch. Scratch.mit.edu But before we begin, let my friend from MIT Scratch, Zoe Bentley, tell you a little bit more about how fun Scratch programming is. Hi there, Zoe. Hi, Dennis. It's nice to see you again. I see you have some friends with you. Hello. Hello. Hi, Zoe. What can I do for you? Just talk a little bit about Scratch programming. Marie and Argo here would like to know more about it. Scratch is a blocks-based visual programming language developed by the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at the MIT Media Lab. It's also the world's largest online coding community for kids. It's used in every country around the world and available in over 40 languages. The idea with Scratch is that young people can become creators of content instead of just consumers. Mm -hmm. With Scratch, you can make stories, you can make a project that moves a robot, you can make animations, art, and music, and you can make your own games. Sounds like something you will like, Marie. <laughs> Scratch is different from other programming languages because it's visual. You snap blocks together to start creating. And you can learn through experimentation and revising, tinkering and trying things out. You can also learn from this giant online community where Scratchers share more than 33,000 projects every day. And because you put blocks together to make code and you don't have to type them, there's no way to write a wrong program. All the blocks work together. Ooh. It's important to learn programming because programming can let you express yourself and your creativity. When you learn to code with Scratch, you learn how to think creatively, reason systematically about things, and work collaboratively with other people. Wow! Programming is fun! It is really fun, and people in the community are always making amazing things. This is a really cool animation someone made, where they animated every single frame and drew a person riding a dragon. I love how fluid the movement is. This is an awesome platformer game someone made where you're exploring a world and you can switch the gravity so that you go to the ceiling or the ground. 
My advice to someone new to Scratch is start with your passions. If you want to make a storytelling project or music or a game, just try it out. Explore the online community for inspiration and just play around with the blocks and see what they do. Thank you. No problem at all. I hope you have fun creating. I'll see you later. Keep on coding. Hi, I'm Dr. Christina Liu and I'm a mosquito expert from the National Environment Agency in Singapore. Hello, I'm Marie and this is Argo. Hello. Um, we seem to be having a small mosquito problem in our house. Ah, that problem. Well, first of all, let's take a look at this. The mosquito has a life cycle with four different stages. The first stage is the egg, which hatches when exposed to water. A larva then emerges. Ew, they're wriggly. Uh, yes, they are. The wriggly larva grows through four larval stages before turning into a pupa. The pupa eventually becomes an adult which has wings and can fly. All in all, it takes about seven days. That's really fast! Yes, it is. And the mosquito doesn't even need much water to breed in. So you might want to check places that you hadn't thought of, such as flower vases, potted plant plates, roof gutters and even toilet bowls. You need to clear all still and stagnant water. And did you also know that the female mosquito is the one that bites us and sucks our blood because she needs the protein in our blood to lay her eggs. She can then go on to lay around 300 eggs in her lifetime. How long can they live for? Well, the female mosquito usually lives for about two weeks in the outside environment, but she can survive for much longer in the laboratory. The male mosquito doesn't live quite as long though. He usually lives for about one to one and a half weeks. That's not very long. Still too long for my liking. So now you know how to prevent mosquitoes from breeding. Take care and good luck. Thank you, Dr. Christina. Bye. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, Argo. Bye-bye. Did you know that there are only less than 70 Javan rhinos left in the entire world? Many of these animals were murdered for their horns. But conservation biologist Colian Pink has been championing the use of technology, such as drones, to learn and protect wildlife and plants. Hello, Mystico. Could you tell us more about how drones can help us learn and protect our biodiversity? Hi, Marie. Drones are just like toy airplanes. Some of the most interesting and endangered wildlife are found deep in the forests or high up in the mountains, places that are difficult and dangerous for people to get to. Scientists can now send drones to those places to take photographs or videos of those wildlife so that we can learn about their ecology and help to protect them. That sounds awesome. Can you tell us a story about a successful drone mission? Sure thing. I'll try not to drone on. <laughs> a few years ago, I was training a team of scientists in Nepal to use drones for patrolling their national parks to protect their endangered wildlife against poachers who want to hunt and kill those animals. But during one of these missions, the drone spotted a pair of one-horned rhinoceros taking a bath in a river. That data allowed scientists to know the location of the rhinos and to be able to track and protect them. Thank you, Vistico. I feel so much better knowing that technology is helping to protect our biodiversity. You're welcome, Marie. Keep exploring and innovating. You could invent the next new technology that makes our world a better place. Bye, Marie! To watch more, subscribe to our YouTube channel.